The effects of tomorrow's strike are already being felt as British Rail runs down its services in preparation for the midnight walkout. In the Falklands, British troops continue the dangerous task of clearing Argentine mines. And the space shuttle Columbia blasts off on its fourth and final test flight. It's in the final hours of countdown. A lightning strike on the launch site in a Florida thunderstorm last night gave Columbia a rough and realistic preparation for this final test flight. After this, it must be a commercial vehicle making regular space flights. But the weather steadily improved over the soggy Cape Canaveral site, and all was well when astronauts Ken Mattingly and Harry Hartsfield walked out to begin their seven-day flight in orbit. T-15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition. 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its first mission, and we have cleared the tower. As Columbia completed its role, space strategists could ponder the Russians have five men, including a French officer, in space now. And this fourth seconds. shuttle Russia flight secure. carries a large and secret military package of experiments. Seconds. Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, uh, 21 nautical miles downrange. Two minutes, three seconds, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. The solid rocket separated correctly and Columbia went on to achieve orbit safely. It'll make several orbital changes this flight separation. and scientists express concern that military objectives are becoming more prominent. America's space shuttle Columbia is tonight orbiting the Earth again for what is its fourth and final test flight. The astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield will be in space for a week. Liftoff from Cape Canaveral was perfect and unusually for Columbia, exactly on time. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition. 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its first mission, and we have cleared the tower. Houston now controlling mission control confirmed roll maneuver started. 20 seconds. The rough looks good. 26 seconds. Roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, one nautical mile in altitude, throttling engines down to 65% now as program. Columbia is now steering for a precise window in space. Columbia is tonight in orbit around the Earth on its fourth and final test flight. Astronauts Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield will be in space for a week. Liftoff from Cape Canaveral was exactly on time. And that's the way it looks tonight. From all of us in ITN, good night. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition. 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its first mission, and we have cleared the tower. Houston now controlling mission control confirmed roll maneuver started. 20 seconds. The rough looks good. 26 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, one nautical mile in altitude, throttling engines down to 65% now as program. Columbia is now steering for a precise window in space.
Ken Mattingly and Henry Hartsfield getting into the Astro van. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. We have main engine ignition. 4, 3, 2, 1. And we have solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle on its first mission, and we have cleared the tower. Houston now controlling. Mission control confirms roll maneuver started. 20 seconds. Rust looks good. 1 minute 57 seconds. Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, uh, 21 nautical miles down. Columbia has arrived back on Earth just over a week after takeoff. It was the end of the shuttle's fourth and final test flight. Columbia had made 112 Here orbits now. before touching down at Edwards Air Force Base in California. President Reagan watched the touchdown, but it was Here's left to mission one. control to express everybody's feeling at the happy and safe return to Earth. This agency's first attempt to put commercial satellites into orbit has failed. The space launcher Ariane blasted off from Kourou in French Guiana just after two o'clock this morning. Its first two stages ignited successfully, but something went wrong with the third stage, and the rocket plunged into the ocean near Ascension Island. Its payload included Marex B, a shipping communication satellite it took British Aerospace three years and 50 million pounds to build. This report from David Chater. This rocket should have launched Europe into one of the fastest expanding industries in the next two decades, chasing America's space shuttle for the multi-million pound business of putting commercial satellites into orbit. But it never made it. Plunging into the Atlantic 14 minutes after takeoff, it took with it two satellites worth 60 million pounds. The head of ITN science unit was there for the launch. The flight went perfectly for the first eight and a half minutes with all engines firing, pushing Ariane up to a height of 110 miles. But then something went wrong. The radar tracker here at launch control suddenly showed Ariane losing height. Puzzled technicians stared at the screen as the angle got steeper and steeper and showed Ariane hurtling back to Earth. They think that either the fuel supply or the guidance system of the third stage failed. 200 communication satellites will be launched in the next decade. Ariane hoped to capture a third of that market. One of the satellites lost today was built mainly by Britain. Developed by British Aerospace and Marconi at a cost of more than 50 million pounds, it should have dramatically improved communications for up to 10,000 ships across the world. Ariane had 35 such contracts for satellite launches on its books. These clients will now take some convincing that their investments are safe. Ariane cost more than 500 million pounds to develop. Most of that money came from France. Britain has barely a 3% stake. But we need the rocket to give a boost to our potentially profitable satellite building program. If Europe is to break the grip of America and the Soviet Union on space, the problems with Ariane will have to be solved. pictures of the well in America a short time ago the space shuttle Columbia was launched back into space for the fifth time it was the smoothest countdown the shuttle program has had so far here's Christopher Wayne although this was the fifth takeoff for Columbia as always it was potentially the most hazardous part of the mission launch sequence itself was fully automated computers controlled the final nine minutes before blast off and we are go for main engine ignition Six. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling. Mission control confirms roll maneuver starting. Columbia now 25 nautical miles in altitude. Two minutes, 15 seconds. Confirm solid rocket booster separation. So another perfect takeoff for Columbia. After four shakedown flights, mission five is the flight which is intended to prove the shuttle can do what it was designed to do, carry satellites and scientists into space. 
The shuttle concept has now been proved and it's reaching the stage where liftoffs and landings are routine. Even the spacesuits being worn by the astronauts are off the shelf. They've been redesigned to three standard sizes and there's no longer the luxury of individual tailoring. For the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, these next few days are very important. It may be the fifth time we've seen the shuttle launched, but this flight has a significant number of firsts. It's the first shuttle flight to carry a full complement of four astronauts, two pilots and two scientists known as mission specialists. It will be the first flight to include a space walk outside the protection of the shuttle capsule. And it's the first time the shuttle has carried a commercial payload, two communication satellites which are being carried up and launched into a geostationary orbit around the Earth. The satellites are the reason why the shuttle's launch window was so short. For other flights, there had been several hours available. This time, the owners of the satellites insisted the payload must be launched within a very short time span. Once again, NASA has chosen middle-aged married family men as crew members. Their combined ages add up to 185 years. The oldest is Vance Brand, the 51-year-old mission commander. He's a veteran of the joint Apollo-Soyuz project with the Russians in 1975. Colonel Bob Obermeyer is the second pilot who shares the duties of Flying Columbia. Dr. Bill Lenoir is one of two scientists aboard. During the spacewalk, he'll carry out the first emergency repair work in space. Helping him will be Dr. Joe Allen, another astronaut scientist. And Dr. Allen will also be testing man's ability to exert physical strength in weightless conditions. The astronauts have been practicing for the spacewalk in a large water tank at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. Underwater conditions are the nearest thing it's possible to create when trying to match weightlessness, but Lenoir and Allen hope to be able to make improvements in the simulation following their own three-hour spacewalk. But all that will be on day three. Before that, the shuttle crew will be putting those two communication satellites into orbit. The launch system will be similar for both. The first, known as SBS-3, will be launched about eight hours after liftoff. First, it will be spun to a speed of 50 revolutions a minute. That's to give it stability, like a gyroscope. Then, when the orbiter is perpendicular to the Earth, explosive bolts will push the satellite away from the spaceship at three feet a second. To the astronauts, it will look as if the satellite is slowly drifting. In reality, it will be travelling at a velocity of 17,500 miles an hour. Once it's been successfully launched, the orbiter will move 16 miles away and the satellite will be fired into a geostationary orbit. At its maximum, the satellite will be 22,300 miles from Earth. The significance in launching these satellites is, of course, that this will one day become a two-way traffic. If they can be sent up in a hold of a spaceship, they can be retrieved and brought back down to Earth. Or they can be repaired, refurbished or modified in space. The shuttle is simply a space workhorse, and the success of this mission will put the Americans firmly back in the lead in terms of achievement, although the Russians next Sunday will be breaking the record for keeping astronauts continuously in space. This flight has been planned by computer almost down to the last second. The computers say it will last five days, two hours and nine minutes precisely. Columbia will land on the dry lake bed at Edwards Air Force Base, California, shortly after dawn on Tuesday the 16th. That'll be about 2.30 in the afternoon, our time. By then, they'll have spent 122 hours in space, hours which will, by all accounts, be a little uncomfortable. The two pilots will sleep in their seats. The two scientists take off just over an hour ago from Cape Canaveral in Florida on its first commercial flight. After four successful test flights, Columbia now has a four-man crew, and two of them are going to be walking in space. David Chater reports. The shuttle launched a new breed of spacemen into orbit today. We'd call them passengers, but they call themselves mission specialists. They're backseat members of the first ever four-man crew America has put into space. And their job will be to look after the first ever commercial cargo carried by the shuttle. It's not as glamorous as the moon landing, but it's a mission which is a significant milestone in putting space to work for man. We have made engine ignition. Three, two, one, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. 
This is Colombia's fifth trip into space. The main goal of the mission is to launch two communication satellites. The space agency has charged about nine million pounds for the job, nowhere near the real cost, but it marks the first step towards shifting the burden of the shuttle from the taxpayers to commercial users. From now on, Colombia and her three sister ships will carry cargo for paying customers. A new technique will be tried out later today for the launch of the satellites from the shuttle's cargo bay. They're released at an altitude of 185 miles. Each one rides in its own cradle, which contains a spring launch mechanism. This spins the satellite prior to launch to provide stability. Then explosive bolts are fired, releasing the springs, which shove the satellite out of the cargo bay. As soon as the shuttle has pulled clear, the satellite fires its own onboard rockets to climb to a geostationary orbit 22,300 miles above the Earth. NASA are confident the system will work. But the American Space Agency has grander designs for the space shuttle. On the drawing board are plans for large orbiting space stations. The success of the shuttle and the fact that it can be used again and again to bring the necessary hardware into, into space means that these stations are one step nearer being built. All that needs to be proved is that the human body can stand long periods of work in zero gravity. In the Irish Republic, two schoolgirls have been kidnapped. At Fifth flight of the American Space Shuttle Columbia got off to a smooth start today. The launch, the most complex so far, went very smoothly. For the first time, computers were in complete control of the countdown from nine minutes before takeoff. We are go for main engine ignition. Six. Six. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one. And solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. 55 seconds, Columbia now four and a half nautical miles in altitude. Mark one minute, pass through Max Q, still looking good. Uh, standing by now for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. Roger, PC. Two minutes. 15 seconds, confirm solid rocket booster separation. Well, news around space editor Reg Turnill is at launch control and hopefully he's on the line now. Hello, Reg. Hello, John. Is everything still going well? So far, so good. Joe Allen, the comic of the crew, has been moving around in bare feet using his toes and saying it's just like having four hands. And Columbia has just passed about 80 kilometers from Russia's value seven. That's had two men aboard for six months, but we don't know yet whether they managed to see each other. Well, what's happening next, Reg? Well, they've just asked for a private medical conference, so one or two might be getting space sick. But apart from that, everything's perfect for popping out the first satellite in three hours' time. Reg, thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. In a packed House of Commons this afternoon, the Prime Minister, Mrs. Margaret... Uh, communication ...satellites on board. It's also the first time there's been a four-man crew on board. Another first for, the, for Columbia was a smooth countdown and launch. Ten, we are go for main engine ignition. Seven, six, six. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board and the shuttle has cleared the tower. This mission will last five days. It's going to cost over 120 million pounds and space officials see it as the first important step towards moving the expense of space operations from the government to commercial users. In a few hours time, the first of the two satellites will be launched into orbit. Seconds, One of the crew's earliest tasks of the mission was to open the payload doors. Later this evening, the first of the two satellites will be launched from the cargo bay. The second satellite will be launched tomorrow. The shuttle is now fully booked until the end of 1986. Most of its cargo will be other satellites. Columbia will be putting two commercial satellites into space. It's the first ever four-man crew America has put into space. And it's also the first time Columbia has made a business trip into orbit, its cargo space rented out to customers. The job of the two extra men in the crew will be to look after the payload of satellites on board. They're the first passengers in space. 13, 12, 11, 10, we're go for main engine ignition. 7, 6, 6, we have main engine ignition. 3, 2, 1, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board and the shuttle has cleared the tower. 
The space agency has charged nine million pounds for the launch of two communication satellites. Nowhere near the real cost, but a bid to attract customers. Mark one minute, ten twenty seconds. Boss looks good. The liftoff was perfect, and the best pictures yet were taken of the separation of the solid rocket boosters, which give the shuttle the punch to escape the pull of gravity. In the orbit, this will, it's hoped, be the bread and butter of the service, proving for NASA that after all the early problems, shuttle can pay its way. It's also the first test for the new EVA suit, which, as you can see, was not named for its sinuous contours. In fact, it stands for Extravehicular Activity Suit. Its backpack, which you can see just jutting out over the shoulder there, is completely self-contained life support system. And for the first time, the astronauts will be able to work on the satellites and cargo in the payload bay without the hindrance of an umbilical cord. To get to the payload bay, they have to leave the shirt-sleeved environment of the cabin, which is at atmospheric pressure, go through this airlock, where the pressure is reduced to virtually nothing, and then into the vacuum in the payload bay, where the satellites and other cargo are kept, and where many of the experiments will be done. They need to be able to work there for three and a half hours, and that's why the new suit is so important. But first, the astronaut has to get into it. And with an undergarment entwined with 300 feet of cooling tubes, that can be quite a struggle, especially in zero gravity. The reason the suit is so baggy is because the air inside it is what protects the astronauts when pressure in the airlock is dropped to match the vacuum outside. Before he can enter the cargo bay, he has to wait for three hours whilst he acclimatizes to the pure oxygen of the suit supply. But first he has to stand upside down to make room for his colleague to enter the airlock and clamber into his suit. Back in the cabin, being upside down isn't always desirable. And on the last shuttle flight, they spent some time grappling with the problem of zero G. One way of staying upright was to anchor the feet under something. Another way is to slip into a pair of suction sandals. They're guaranteed to stick to the floor. But not so good when it comes to moving. More violent movement of the sort no red-blooded American can do without is provided by this treadmill though to get it all tired in zero gravity, you have to tie yourself down and wear a lead-filled belt. All of which goes a long way towards working up an appetite for dinner. Rehydrated food packets go into this aluminium suitcase which contains a heater, and it's a fridge for drinks on the other side. The food goes in one side, and 20 minutes later, it reappears reconstituted and ready to eat. Providing, of course, that they remember to stick it to something before they dig in. Without going into the menu, the food is a vast improvement from the Apollo days, which is just as well. They're up there for another five days. Sumble is back in space for the fifth time. She had a smooth launch and is now well established into her five-day mission. Our aerospace correspondent, Christopher Wayne, watched the launch. And we are go for main engine ignition. Columbia blasted off right on time at exactly 19 minutes past the hour. Unlike the previous four proving flights, this was a proper commercial operation. Instead of two test pilots, there was a full crew of four astronauts, including a physicist and an engineer. And in the cargo hold, there were two communication satellites, one American, one Canadian, to be put into orbit round the Earth. So this five-day mission is intended to prove that Columbia can do the job she was designed for and that the United States has got value for the six billion pounds so far spent on the shuttle program. The latest pictures we've received show the cargo doors of the shuttle open as the Columbia moves into a perpendicular position. The first of the two satellites is being released at the moment. Once it's clear of the shuttle, it'll be boosted by rocket into a geostationary orbit. This mission will last five days. Columbia is due to return to Earth on Tuesday afternoon. After only a few hours in space, the Americans passed the orbiting Russian space station Salyut 7. The two-man Russian crew was launched into space in April. On Sunday, they break the previous endurance record of 185 days in space. They haven't been all alone that time. There have been visits from the French and fellow cosmonauts, but they're on their own now, apart from passing traffic. 
And that's the nine o'clock news. Space shuttle Columbia, on its fifth flight into space, has launched one of two privately owned communication satellites. It's the first time Columbia has carried a commercial cargo. The second satellite, also financed privately, will be put into orbit tomorrow night. As David Chater reports, the space trip so far has gone just as smoothly as they wanted. It's the first ever four-man crew America has put into space, and it's also the first time Columbia has made a business trip into orbit, its cargo space rented out to customers. The job of the two extra men in the crew will be to look after the payload of satellites on board. They're the first passengers in space. 13, 12, 11, 10, we are go for main engine ignition. Six, we have main engine ignition. Three, two, one, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. The space agency has charged nine million pounds for the launch of the two communication satellites. Nowhere near the real cost, but a bid to attract customers. Mark one minute, ten twenty seconds. Force looks good. The liftoff was perfect, and the best pictures yet were taken of the separation of the solid rocket boosters. They give the shuttle the punch to escape the pull of gravity. Fifteen seconds. Confirm solid rocket booster separation. The cargo doors on Columbia were opened earlier tonight for the launch of the first of the satellites. It was done using entirely new technique. First, it was spun on its axis to provide stability. Then explosive bolts were fired, releasing springs, which literally catapulted the satellite out of the hold. It then fires its own onboard rockets to climb into a geostationary orbit 22,300 miles above the Earth. So far, the mission has been a complete success. Into space of the shuttle Columbia, and it's all going well. The trip is significant in the fact that it's part of a 5,000 million pound project marking the beginning of the commercial use of space travel. That becomes a reality in just over an hour's time when the shuttle puts its second satellite into orbit. It's the Canadian satellite, and it's called ANIC. Here's Jane Corbin. If Annex C follows the smooth pattern set by SBS's satellite last night, there'll be a party back at Mission Control in Houston. For Columbia will have proved that she is capable of doing what she was designed to do, provide a guaranteed and relatively cheap way of putting satellites into space. And some of the $10 million cost will have been justified. NASA claims the shuttle will make the commercial exploration of space a reality. Six. Six. We have main engine ignition. Three, two, one, and solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. The first satellite launch came exactly eight hours after Columbia's own liftoff from Cape Kennedy. Joseph Allen, one of the four scientists on the mission, successfully launched the SBS satellite last night. He commanded spinning of the satellite like a gyroscope to provide the necessary stability once the satellite left the craft. Then SBS was ejected by springs. Later it fired its booster rockets to take it to its final destination, 22,300 miles above the Earth. The two satellites between them will provide business and TV communications for America and Canada. IBM is the major partner in the consortium that built the SBS satellite. They see it as their way into the lucrative long-distance phone call market dominated at present by AT&T, America's giant telecommunications company. Allen and Lenoir plan a spacewalk on Sunday outside the shuttle, wearing space suits with a built-in power pack. This walk is crucial to NASA's aim to prove that the shuttle is a flexible craft and astronauts will be able to repair satellites from Columbia. The race for space is on because Columbia is not the only launcher touting for satellite business. The European Space Agency's launcher, Ariane, which has made three successful missions, is Columbia's main competitor. France and Germany are the major shareholders, but Britain has a 2.4% share. Lawrence McGinty assesses the claims of the rivals. The American Space Agency is charging £12 million for launching the two communication satellites on the shuttle now in orbit. It will cost nearly £10 million to launch a satellite on the shuttle and another three or £4 million for the booster to lift the satellite into high orbit around the Earth. But lots of people are willing to pay the price. By 1987, 
the shuttle should have carried into space seven payloads for the US Air Force and 18 other secret military payloads. Scientific and commercial cargoes will bring the total number of shuttle flights to 70. The shuttle's rival, Europe's Ariane rocket, is by comparison old-fashioned. It's a conventional one-shot rocket. Because Ariane is not reusable, it should cost more to use to launch satellites. But Ariane has one advantage over the shuttle. It can carry satellites directly to the high orbits over the Earth where their operators want them to be. That makes the cost of launching rockets on Ariane and shuttle roughly the same. However, confidence in Ariane is not very high after its disastrous flight in September when it plunged into the Atlantic Ocean, taking two satellites worth more than 30 million pounds with it. Nevertheless, Ariane Spass, the company that operating with customers for launches on a more powerful version of its rocket. That could mean another 15 launches. The shuttle can launch satellites and all eyes will now be on Ariane's next attempt to put satellites into space in April. Back here on Earth, the businessmen are planning their participation in and profits from the space race. British companies like Marconi Space and Defence Systems are busy working on the specialist electronics which fit inside the satellite shell and provide its specific function, whether TV or defence communications. They've made future bookings on both Ariane and the shuttle. Everybody wants to talk to everybody else much more than they used to. You know that, with your own telephone bill. But uh, added to that, across the Atlantic recently, telephone traffic has increased by 25% per annum. And now computers are being introduced and they want to talk to each other. You want to pass television um, programs back and forth across the Atlantic. And that's just between the Western developed countries. All the less developed countries are getting a taste for it. They want to introduce it too. There are at present two launches to actually put your product into space. There's NASA's shuttle and the Europeans Ariane. Is that competition good for commercial companies like Marconi? Yes, it's, uh, it's very good indeed because it, uh, it certainly must help to keep the price down. What the true price for launching either satellites by shuttle or, or Ariane is, I don't think anybody really knows at the moment because they're competing so hard. Um, both uh, systems have their advantage, but uh, officially the shuttle should be cheaper, but it has... Uh, the disadvantage that uh, you have very much more safety uh, considerations to take into account because you might have to bring the satellite back unlaunched. And um, also you have to put another rocket on the satellite to get it up to full height for using it for communication purposes. But overall you think that competition is healthy? Oh, it's very healthy, yes. NASA hope the shuttle will go on to achieve other firsts in the commercial exploration of space. I asked Dr. Tom Payne, the ex-head of NASA, how he saw Columbia's future. Well, the space shuttle is the first step towards the reusable space transportation system. And the next project that uh, NASA has uh, its dreamers working on is to put a permanent space station up, in which case the space shuttle will be the back and forth routine uh, travel. So no matter how you slice it, the uh, space shuttle is here to stay and uh, improved ones will come in the future, but this is a very important first step. How big could shuttle be commercially? Well, I would expect to see a number of missions carried out uh, every month as we bring the second, third, and fourth orbiter on, and then there's discussion of a, of a fifth orbiter. And as we learn to shorten the turnaround times down at Cape Kennedy between missions, uh, we'll be able to carry an enormous amount of cargo up. The Europeans, of course, have got Ariane. The shuttle may never break even. Doesn't the commercial competition worry you? Well, I personally welcome the competition. I think it's wonderful that the Europeans have their own uh, approach to it. Uh, I think that as far as the competitions go, you have to remember that there's more to the shuttle than just taking a payload up, or even the fact that we can now bring a payload down. It also drastically changes the way we design the payloads. We're designing them now to be refurbished, to be tended by the shuttle. We can put film packs in in one mission and take them out in another. We can put whole colonies of satellites free flying up and then visit them in future shuttle missions. So it's really as important in the new things we can do in the payloads as it is in the fact that it's a low-cost transportation And device. you're convinced it's going to make money? Well, we're going to charge enough money so that uh, no matter how much the costs go up, we're, we're going to get that amount from anybody that wants to launch. 
optimistic words from Dr. Payne, but military and government projects are more likely to balance the shuttle's books for NASA. Only time and more successful launches will tell whether Ariane or Columbia will make the real money in space. And the main news again tonight, Yuri Andropov has succeeded Leonid Brezhnev as leader of the Soviet Communist Party. There's still no news about the whereabouts of Lech Wałęsa. And in Edinburgh... Space Shuttle Columbia has fulfilled its first contract in space by sending into orbit a second communication satellite. The first is already orbiting the Earth 23,000 miles up. The second was sent early this evening to join it. The four-man crew said today everything was operating perfectly. This report from David Chater. What you're seeing is no simulation, but the actual satellite sitting in a cradle in the shuttle's cargo bay. The space agency was paid nearly 10 million pounds to launch this and its companion into orbit. A computer starts its spinning prior to launch to provide stability. Inside, mission specialist Joe Allen keeps a watchful eye on the cargo to see the deal go through without a hitch. Explosive bolts are fired, releasing springs which literally catapult the satellite out of the hold. Strung beneath it, its own onboard rocket motor. It's an entirely new technique, but one which NASA had to prove would work. The successful launch of the second satellite less than two hours ago proves that it does. The particles you're about to see are splinters from the cargo bay produced by the launch. The flash is sunlight reflecting in the satellite's solar cells. When the shuttle has pulled far enough away from the satellite, a distance of more than 20 miles, the signal is sent to fire its own motor. It then accelerates rapidly away, as seen in this simulation, to climb into a geostationary orbit 22,300 miles above the Earth. For NASA's competitors in the multi-million pound satellite business, the message is clear. For test flights, this is Columbia's first commercial venture into space. In its cargo hold were two communication satellites which the shuttle put into orbit without any problems. And we are go for main engine ignition. It was the smoothest countdown that the shuttle program has had so far. The launch sequence itself was fully automated with computers controlling the final nine minutes before blast off. The first operational space shuttle mission with two satellites on board and the shuttle has cleared the tower. 55 seconds, Columbia now four and a half nautical miles in altitude. Marcus pre-planned on three good engines. One minute, 45 seconds. While the four previous Columbia flights proved the shuttle concept, this was the first commercial venture for the program, with a payload right, of one Bill, Canadian television satellite good. and one American communication okay, satellite. Yeah, we see it down here, Bill, it's beautiful. Mike, if you ask for the item 8 internal power, I missed it. Okay, Bill, we just now got it. You have a go for internal power. But right now it looks Both good. satellites in the shuttle's cargo bay, bay were successfully on, put into orbit. And we apparently got very good TV and photo documentation of it. Over. All uh, right, we're really looking forward to seeing that, Bill. Welcome back. Today's spacewalk from the shuttle Columbia was cancelled because the astronauts' new million-pound spacesuits turned out to be faulty. Two astronauts should have ventured into space to test their new self-contained suits, but they found faults they couldn't repair on the spot. But NASA is not too disappointed. It says the most important part of the mission was to launch two communication satellites. The shuttle's crew completed that task on Saturday. In Angola, three Americans are to be released from prison tomorrow in a swap for three Soviet Big prisoners. Big setback for the space shuttle's mission, which is due to end tomorrow. The suits, which months ago had been immersed in water to simulate weightlessness, have had a history of development problems, problems which have inflated the price of a NASA contract for 43 of them from $47 million to $107 million. Today's planned dual spacewalk was to have been their first real test and the mission's last major objective. One of the two scientists aboard Columbia was to have walked the length of the 60-foot cargo bay during a three-hour test. Instead, they played around with gyroscopes and a model of a satellite, while Mission Control pondered whether there should be another attempt tomorrow. But that's unlikely, and so tomorrow's return to Earth for a California homecoming won't be completely triumphant. To know what went wrong with those two million dollar spacesuits. Two hundred eighty nine 
nine months. When this mission was first planned, it was intended to have a fully automatic landing, but then it was decided it would be better to leave a test pilot in Still control. Now. The touchdown was flawless. Unofficial touchdown time was five days, two hours, 14 minutes, 25 seconds. The main purpose of the flight, launching two commercial satellites into orbit from the cargo hold, was achieved. So, as a commercial venture, Mission 5 was a success. But two problems did occur. The first was space sickness. It hit two of Columbia's four-man crew and caused the cancellation of the space walk on Sunday. NASA doctors just don't know enough about space sickness to treat it. Their worry is that if an astronaut were to suffer an acute attack while working outside the shuttle, it could be fatal. The other problem was that the multi-million pound space suits of astronauts Bill Lenore and Joe Allen both developed faults. Yesterday, these caused the spacewalk to be called off. So far, the shuttle program has cost NASA about six billion pounds. The first four missions were simply test flights. This month has seen the first commercial flight, and next year the first three missions by a new shuttle, Challenger, will carry satellites for Indonesia, Canada, Germany and India. Those launches are planned for January, April and July. In September, Columbia will launch the European Space Lab, and in November, Challenger will take up the first secret military payload. The Soviet Union has ignored shuttle technology and concentrated on keeping astronauts in orbiting space laboratories for months at a time. On Sunday, Russian astronauts broke the space endurance record. American space officials gave details today of how a Soviet satellite helped them find a crashed aircraft that nobody on the ground even knew about. And it had happened only a quarter of a mile from the end of a runway, killing eight people. The Americans say the twin-engined aircraft crashed into a forest in rain and darkness just after takeoff from the Blue Ridge in Virginia. Nobody noticed the crash, but the Russian satellite picked up an emergency radio signal, which was passed on to Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. They told Blue Ridge, and a rescue team went out and found the wreckage. The former appeared just after dawn. As it glided in to land, the spacecraft seemed to turn to gold in the glow of the early morning sun. Gear down. We show the gear lock now. Mission Commander Vance Brand at the controls brought her down smoothly onto a concrete runway. Unofficial touchdown time was five days, two hours, 14 minutes, 25 seconds. Newsround space editor Reg Turnell watched the landing from Kennedy Space Center, and he's on the phone now. Hello, Reg. How does NASA feel that this mission has gone? Uh, well, very happy about deploying the first two satellites, John, and in fact the four astronauts are just appearing on closed-circuit TV here, and uh, of course they were very happy about that marvelous short landing. The crew were testing the brakes to see how quickly Columbia could stop in an emergency. But space sickness is still a big worry. Six out of 12 men on five flights. But they insist it's really no worse than sea sickness. Well, Colum uh, Columbia's safely down now, Reg. Uh, what's the news about the next flight? Well, that'll be done by Challenger, which is a much lighter and more advanced space shuttle than Columbia. And that should be uh, at the end of January next. At present, it has a crew of four, but uh, they're so disappointed about having lost the spacewalk that they're thinking of sending Joe Allen and Bill Lenore up on the next flight to give them a second chance to do that spacewalk. Ah. Well, Reg, thanks very much indeed for all your reports about the mission. Bye for now. One of Britain's greatest comedy stars, Arthur Askey, has died at the age of 82. Columbia has had a smooth landing in California after its five-day flight. Columbia launched two commercial satellites, establishing the spacecraft for the first time as a cargo-carrying moneymaker. David Chater reports on the shuttle's return to Earth. On the 
monitors in the Caught on a camera from a spotter plane, this is the moment that Columbia I turns from a spacecraft into what the astronauts call a flying brick. Blazing down from an orbital speed of more than 17,000 miles an hour, pilot Robert Overmeyer had to fight the force of gravity to slow it to just under 200 miles an hour. Now on its fifth flight, and with more than 10 million miles clocked up on its milometer, Columbia touched down on the Californian desert eight minutes after sunrise, and some 30 seconds early. It was a performance that put into the shade the minor problems they had on the mission, and even left them time for a few jokes with mission control. Absolutely, it was beautiful, and you certainly lived up to your motto this flight. Welcome home. Yes, sir, we deliver. Columbia will now get a well-earned rest until next September, when it will carry Europe's space lab into orbit. Its sister ship, Challenger, will be next into space. The crew, is the crew led by Commander Vance Brand, said it had been a fantastic voyage. But NASA admitted that the problem of space sickness still needs a lot more research before the five shuttle missions planned for next year. This will be the last flight for a, a, a good year or so of Columbia, the first operational shuttle. You see it go, going up there. It's just about to perform the roll. This puts the orbiter underneath the boosters, because if anything does happen, it means they can clear a lot easier. And then they'll cut to the telephoto cameras here. That's at a height of 26 miles, and the cameras are still locked on. There go the boosters. The boosters are recoverable, except on the fourth mission, of course, they sunk in the water. Because the whole idea of this mission was it was an operational mission. The first four were really experimental. This time they were carrying satellites as a commercial payload. They were going to get reimbursed for the cost, and of course it had to work right. And this is the first one, um, satellite business system satellite going off. As you can see, that was going on, looking out the window at it. Springs push it away, it spins it, because these sort of satellites are what are called spin stabilised. And you can just about see the engine underneath it, which will push it into a higher orbit. And of course this was the first one that carried the four crew. And landed safely. But it was a big disappointment, the was the, so they, they never actually did their spacewalk? They, they didn't do the spacewalk. Um, it, it was a shame, although I, personally I feel that launching the satellites was the more important part. And as I said, that, that's Columbia coming down for the last time for probably... It's due to go up again, refurbished, due next September, carrying Space Lab. But Challenger goes up in uh, Challenger, January. which will be the second <coughs> operational one, will go up in January carrying a very large uh, communication satellite. Right, but let's look a bit more to the future, Matt, because uh, 25 years of space now, and we heard yes. from this um, ex-boss of NASA that maybe people living on Mars and on the Moon next century. What's going to happen? Well, you can only really speculate. I mean, if you look at one of these pictures, the uh, artist's impressions, now, they're... The shuttle in that particular picture, it's actually very, very tiny on the right-hand side, but these sort of st structures are actually very, very enorm enormous. And there really isn't any limit to how big you can build them. You see the next picture. Now, you can't even see the shuttle in that picture. The thing is so large. This is a very, very um, a large uh, power satellite mm. collecting rays from the sun and then beaming it and back built in Earth. space? Built in space by using techniques such as the shuttle. It would take a lot of payloads. I mean, the payload of the shuttle is very, very big but it will still take a lot of flights. But you, once you're up there, and you can take up machines to make beams to build your structures from. And also you can use the external tank as well, the bit that's thrown away at the moment. Oh. Well, uh, it could well be, do you think, Matt, that some of our viewers today could, could be living on Mars or the Moon in the next century? Well, let's put it this way. Going back to the lunar module, this was only about 30 years away, and everybody thought it was a fan very fanciful idea. And of course, we, we, we know it's, it's already gone and passed with the lunar module. Matt, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll go uh, out, well, not quite into space, but to Nottingham. Keith? Yes, well, we've got lots of space.